Welcome to this uh, this briefing. Uh, we are looking at uh, considerations for audit committees in, in what is uh, a very unprecedented and unusual time. Um, and uh, we are looking to effectively uh, give, I guess, a heads up to what you should be as non-execs and audit committee uh, members and chairs asking of your executives uh, and, and of your finance teams as well. So if we move across to uh, the slide deck uh, and what we'll do is I'll introduce the speakers on today's uh, um, call. Um, so thank you, Anthony. Anthony, if you can just do the first slide. So today's speakers, um, myself, Matthew White, I'm senior partner of BDO, uh, and I also run our non-exec director program uh, with responsibility uh, feeding in uh, to the audit stream and across all the other streams. Um, Scott Knight joins us. He is um, head of audit um, and works on a number of FTSE clients, uh, so has a, a great deal of experience with audit committee chairs uh, and also uh, auditing large uh, uh, entities. Um, Scott also sits on the uh, Audit and Insurance Council for the FRC and so has uh, quite a significant amount of insight uh, for the um, uh, FRC and what is on their agenda at the present moment. Andy Viner is uh, an audit partner and global head of uh, media, uh, works extensively within uh, the private equity uh, field but also the listed field uh, and therefore deals with um, non-executives who have slightly different uh, views uh, being either private equity focused uh, which is slightly more management led or indeed listed. Uh, and then finally, and uh, who I'll pass over to in a minute uh, is Anthony. Uh, Anthony Appleton joined us very recently uh, in May um, in fact, I don't think he's uh, actually been in the, uh, the office as yet, but um, uh, he's joined us from the FRC um, uh, where he was uh, um, uh, effectively gamekeeper or poacher, I'm not sure which side, um, but he's obviously reversed those sides now and joined us in our technical standard group uh, and is leading our, uh, our technical uh, insight in terms of uh, financial reporting. So with that, I'll hand over to Anthony and uh, let you uh, take the floor, Anthony. Thanks, Matt. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, as Matt just said, I just recently joined from the FRC. And uh, back in March, we issued guidance for um, um, preparers and for auditors um, in response to the coronavirus. So we did that in conjunction with the Bank of England and the FCA. But I wrote the, uh, the guidance on corporate reporting and corporate governance that went into that. Um, and so in developing that, one of the things we did was reach out to a number of institutional investors to understand what their key concerns were. We also spoke to major firms such as BDO to understand what they were finding. But, but, but from, that, from that, that, that research, I think what we can identify is a few key things for both investors and indeed for the regulators, um, as shown on the slide. Um, the first one is transparency and clarity. At this time, there's unprecedented levels of uncertainty. So, so what investors are looking for is for companies with a story they can understand and trust. They realize that there is, every company is facing uncertainties and, they, and, they, and they're looking for openness about that to provide some kind of context for their investment decisions. They're looking for stories that make sense to them. And in, this, in, in, in today's uncertain world, that really means explaining the assumptions you've made, the predictions that you have, uh, 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 and your forecasts, because because they will drive much of your accounting and reporting and indeed um, um, uh, planning. Um, so so we expect you to open some that, expect you to use disclosures in the reports, but also I think for audit committees, it's for you to be challenging some of those uh, predictions, challenging those assumptions made. Did it make sense? Are they up to date? Uh, and, and indeed, are they properly disclosed? Next key thing for investors is clearly resilience. I mean, that was their immediate concern. Do companies have the, the liquidity to, to, to withstand the, the shock of the pandemic? And so, information on how you reacted, how the company uh, um, um, adapted, how it, what closures were there, how has this impacted on, on, on performance? But importantly, where is the cash to to make this uh, uh, to withstand the shock? Thinking about the source of cash, the source of finance, possible future source of finance that you have, 
But if this, it, it, what, one thing of particular interest to the regulator is, well, if you're talking about having to move cash around the business, is this done through dividends? And if so, we need you need to ensure that all the legal requirements are getting dividends around the group and that. And so I think that's one area you want to kind of challenge your 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 board to. Third key area is management control. I mean, with the level of dislocation that the pandemic has caused, with site closures, people working from home, disruptions to supply chain, uh, and, and we've had to adapt and that was that quickly. Now this dislocation could could impact on management's ability to control. Have they have they been getting the information that they used to? By which they they can manage, and what about but what about control processes? What about with process over risk management? Some of those will have had to be shortcutted, circumvented because of the immediate dislocation. But but what mitigation did they put in place to ensure you know, that that reliance can still be personally active? And I think the fourth the fourth key area, and and this really did come out of investor discussion as as strongly as resilience was was. How is a business model adapting? And, and importantly, what are businesses doing to protect their key value drivers? You know, these value drivers will, will often be intangible. It might be workforce or what have been done to protect them, to retain them, because investors recognize that, that recovery needs the corporate knowledge of that workforce. And so what's been done to maintain and to allow the, a recovery to, to be well managed? Um, also, think about brand and reputation. What are we doing to protect those? You know, we can we, we can see that after this, people will look back and, and 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 ask the question: What did you do during the crisis? And and consideration of business ethics and and and, and decisions. You know, how are they going to be 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 made such as to protect uh, our reputation? So I think they're four key themes that 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 your challenge should build around. Um, at BDO, we've, we've developed a model called Rethink, where we, which is a framework to help companies you know, plan and manage both the initial phase of the crisis in terms of how they react through lockdown, how we how we were returning resilience, but importantly also looking forward to well, what we call it now, aren't we, the new normal, and what kind of adaptations are needed going forward, and 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 and, and any BDO contacts can provide you. For the information on that, but I do think also provides a good framework for, for think about the report and make sure we are we, we're providing a kind of, kind of complete information set. So in terms of react, you know what happened in the initial response, what was the impact on financial performance, um, and thinking through the, the balance sheet did that should be reflecting how things were at that time, not how things were are subsequently. So so what were expectations at a March annual year end or or, or will be at a June interim year end? It should be based on the facts then, not at the day at which you produce your account. So, so it's an issue of our hindsight. But thinking through, some forward looking is needed. So thinking through and things like um, um, identifying onerous contracts. They, they should be rec those losses should be recognised then, but not recognising future operating losses. So put yourself in the mind of the balance sheet there. Second phase is resilience. And this is, this is about how, how we manage through lockdown. And investors will want to know, as I've said, things like source of finance and, and whether there have been any covenant breaches, what renegotiations are going on to, 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 to maintain uh, uh, solvency. As I said earlier, what you're doing about preserving sources of value, that should be in your strategic report. Um, and how you're managing them, how, they, how you are, are preserving sources of value for the future. Also in the strategic report, principal risks and uncertainties need to be reviewed. You know, have risk registers been updated? If so, how have they been reflected as specific key principal risks for the business? Um, and, then, and, then, and then the third phase of, of, of our model is looking forward to the, to, um, to the new normal. And in terms of going concern assessments, well, well that you want to be using information in, at the date of reporting. So let's say within the resilience phase, but you've also got to be looking forward. It's also got to be looking forward to what, what, what adaptations might be needed long term in working out whether whether the, the entity will remain a going concern. But also importantly, the material and certainly disclosures that go with that, and, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Back to the strategic report, though. Um, um, you know, business model is a central piece. How is that going to change? What does the future look like? Is there going to be um, product substitution needed? 
Are you going to need to move to more online? How is, how is the market going to change? And similarly for trends and factors, you know, we can imagine this new normal. There will be new, a new, new, new. Um, uh, there'll be changes to society. There'll be changes to economics. There'll be changes to markets. How are we ready to adapt to that? And what can we say in terms of trends and factors in the strategic report? One thing I mentioned a couple of times: gun concern assessments. And I think this is this this will be a key concern for 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 the auditor, key area of challenge. And I think it needs to be key, key area for audit committee chairs in their discussions with the board. Central to that is there needs to be a robust assessment of the gun concern assessment of gun concern. Um, so challenging the assumptions, what assumptions being made about the future, have multiple scenarios being considered to to understand. The risks related to it. Um, we're seeing a lot more reverse stress testing done right now. So that's looking to see what changes in terms of revenue, in terms of length of lockdown, in terms of the extent of government support. You know, at what level would, 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 would could would those variables have to change for the company to be in in, in serious trouble? So that kind of reverse stress testing to see you know, will the company does the company look likely to continue. And I've also mentioned that at least 12 months. Do bear in mind, you're supposed to look forward to the foreseeable future. That isn't a default of 12 months. It is at least that. So if there's going to be significant capital refinancing needed or renegotiations beyond 12 months that you can foresee, then you need to factor those into it. Um, the other side is disclosures. Um, um, the, the, the FRC will expect to see a lot more material and certainty disclosures. Um, and we went to some, some length to try and socialize that idea with investors. Um, you know, if investors haven't been used to seeing this, there was a concern that this may have come as a shock and it would overreact to, to, to it. So we tried. So at the FRC, we were trying. I'm sure they'll continue to to, to socialise the notion that these are expected and these will give you just insight and context for uh, um, and the current uncertainties the company's facing. Um, even if you conclude it's not material certainty, that was a significant judgment. That judgment might need disclosing too. Um, there was actually a, a ruling by by IFRIC, part of the International Account Standards Board, a few years ago that suggested that could be necessary. Finally, corporate governance code, clearly there needs to be a statement in there too, ongoing concern, but also don't forget the interaction with things like the viability statement as well. Um, and and, um, and be ready to think about, about the future viability in this changing world. Um, Anthony, hi, it's Matt. If I can just interrupt, first of all, um, uh, to our audience, if you want to ask questions as we go through, please do uh, just uh, put a question in the question box and we'll pick them up and uh, feed them into uh, the presentation. Um, but I've just got a, a, a quick question for Scott Knight, uh, if I may. Um, Scott, I know that we've got heightened procedures in terms of uh, any audit sign-offs at the moment, and in fact, uh, yourself uh, and members of our audit stream exec review all going concern. Uh, reviews at the present moment in terms of giving opinion. I'm just wondering what practical advice can you give our, our non-exec community um, in terms of these going concern reviews and are our audit firms being overly cautious at the moment or are we seeing I guess a, a move much more to the modification in terms of the audit report uh, on a practical basis? Mm. So the biggest um, practical step I would advise is um, step back before sticking your head into a spreadsheet because invariably um, once you start looking at spreadsheets and forecasts you can't forget what you've already seen so it's thinking about and asking the questions how is this environment impacting on our customers our suppliers or their customers and their suppliers um, I'm thinking about the whole ecosystem because the chances are the primary impact will be in the forecast you're looking at. But the secondary and tertiary impacts are the ones that are easily missed and the most difficult to find. Um, also, look at what uh, industry-wide forecasts are out there. What, um, what are others talking about in that particular sector? And only then dive into the spreadsheet because it's so easy to get lost in spreadsheets. And in terms of are the accounting firms being overly cautious, um, you know, it's a question that's being asked of all of us. Um, 
will certainly remain open for business. I think there was a period in March and April where, you know, there was so much uncertainty. A couple of firms just said, we're going to wait till after Easter. But, you know, I, I think you've got to remain open issuing opinions. I don't think we've been overly cautious. At one point, there was a bar and restaurant group who complained that we were being overly cautious. And we had said the test must be that they remain shut until September and then a phased recovery in the six months after that. And um, in retrospect, I don't think that that was overly cautious. I think now that looks like a reasonably good call. So, um, you know, the, it will be subjective what uh, people are forecasting. But I think in general, the accounting firms haven't been overly cautious. And Scott, in terms of reverse stress testing, can you just run through the practicalities of that as well? So essentially, uh, the easiest answer is you hold everything um, in, you fix every variable other than one, and you just run that until the model breaks. Now that could be revenue levels, it could be for you know, a, a travel company, it could be deposits, or it could be um, the refunds on earlier deposits. But it's the one key variable. Construction companies, how many sites can remain open? But you hold one variable, you hold all other variables, and you run the model to it breaks. And then you say, where on the normal distribution curve is that scenario? Is it plausible, or is it just so extreme it's never going to happen? Thanks, Scott. Okay, I'll, I'll move up. Um, I will if I can. So, it's like technical problem trying to find out and move the slides again. I've forgotten them at five minute break. Um, uh, one question that's been asked throughout the pandemic and, and certainly earlier in the, in the year was, is COVID-19 an adjusting post balance sheet event? I'm saying I think that's the wrong question. Uh, and and COVID-19 is not one event. It is a whole series of, uh, uh, there's a whole series of impacts from COVID-19. And we have to think about those as individual events. Uh, and uh, this might be things like liquidation of a, of a company, uh, of a client, sorry, sorry customer post year end. If it's close to the year end, well, it suggests that the credit risk was high at, at, at the reporting date, and so we'd need to adjust. Other events would be the introduction of the uh, lockdown, depending on when your period end was. It might be the introduction of government support. All of these are, are, are events that need to be thought about separately. Now, now, now the key thing is, as I'm sure you're, you're aware, you only adjust for events if it gives you more information about the balance sheet date. If these are events that don't relate to, to, to the situation, the balance sheet date, and you don't adjust for them. But, 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 but really, that's not the end of the story. I think what we've got to recognize is the aim is for you to put yourself back in the position you were at at the reporting date. And what were reasonable expectations at that point in time? What future events might you have anticipated? Now, you can't, you can't then look and see if those, if those events happened, you had 100% certainty at the year and that, that they would, but you didn't. So what you've got to do is think, okay, what's the likelihood? What's the probability of this? And they will be reflected to some extent in measurement. And if you think about something like investment in a liquid, um, in, in a, in a uh, FTSE 100 company, you know, the market price at the balance sheet date would have anticipated, would have been based on the market expectations and the probability of these future events. And in the same, and, and you wouldn't then adjust subsequently. But, but that notion of the way that, that, that valuation does involve expectations and the, and the probability of those expectations is something we need to take into account in measurement. Now, one particular, sorry, wrong word. In particular, that will come up with impairment reviews. So, as a, as a first point, reiterate, you know, you can't use hindsight and say, well, event happened after the year end, so I can I can take 100% of that impact into my year end position, but. At the year end, you may have had, had some expectation of that, and, and as I said, some kind of probability weighted approach might be the only way of coming up with a fair impairment review. So that might involve using multiple scenarios and, 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 and considering the impact of the uncertainty, both in terms of cash flows and the discount rate to use. 
gone back to the earlier point, assumptions and, judgment and, and judgments are critical. They should be disclosed. Uh, the standard requires certain disclosures, but I think they need to be as transparent as possible. I'd, I'd recommend people don't read any of those disclosure requirements too narrowly and provide all you can to give investors the proper context. Um, one area that the FRC is always particularly interested in as well is sensitivity analysis and, 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 and the clarity that provides in putting a context around the numbers that have been put in the balance sheet. And Anthony, can I just again just ask Andy from a practical perspective, um, Andy, what are you seeing when you, you're talking to clients in terms of the impairments, whether it's a half year review or, or a full year and any lessons learned from that point? Yeah, thanks, Matt. So um, I'm starting to be asked quite a lot of questions of December year end clients who've got half years coming up, um, particularly listed, name listed clients, um, as to what they should do around around the half year. And generally, most impairment reviews take place at the year end, so it's never, it's often not such a big deal at the half year. But what we're seeing is much more engagement with us around those impairment reviews. Boards obviously seeing, in, in some cases, the market cap going well below the goodwill value and the need to consider impairment. Um, a, a number of boards are quite nervous about uh, making an impairment review at the half year and then having to make a further review at the full year end. So obviously it needs to be accurate the half year, but generally they're taking quite a cautious view, particularly at this moment in time, to avoid uh, having to make a second impairment review. So I suppose. Ultimately, what we're seeing is much more engagement around impairment reviews at the half year, whereas we typically wouldn't have had too much engagement on some clients at that point in time. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ed. Um, moving on, I'm not, I'm not going to go into any of the depths of financial instruments account and all the issues related to coronavirus, but just to say there will be some and kinds of questions you want to be asking the board, you know, if they've got any hedging in, re, in, in place, let's say, for future foreign currency sales or foreign currency purchases. Now, uh, uh, can, you keep, can they still consider those to be highly probable, which is the test for applying hedge accounting, or does that need to be discontinued? Um, impairments, you know, these, are, these are issues not just for financial institutions, but all corporates with their trade receivables. Now, have assessments of expected credit losses been, been updated? Have um, and provision metrics has been updated for the for the change in economics. Um, for those who, who are issuing loans, has there been a, a, a consideration about significant increase in credit risk? Again, we won't go into the detail, but 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 that needs to be something the board are considering because it changes the way impairments are measured. And also, you know, if they've had renegotiations, what have been the impact of those? Does it lead to any? reclassifications as, as current rather than long term, or does it lead to remeasurement of some financial assets and financial liabilities? So so questions and, and, and areas for you to to discuss with the board and, and, and challenge them on. Finally, a few other areas of challenge, um, and uh, some of them I already mentioned, almost contracts, looking to see, you know, reviewing those to see if there are, are any contracts for future services and goods which are now onerous. Um, there will be a, 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 some demand for trying to develop alternative performance measures or identifying out as exceptional by, by management. You know, the, the regulator has been very clear in, in one of its strongestly worded um, and pieces of guidance uh, um, that, that, that really shows their scepticism about the ability to do that in, in, in a reliable way. So that, that guidance is, is, is really quite strong on, on uh, and advising. Uh, absolute caution on the use of those. Um, other things, you know, deferred tax assets might no longer be recoverable and they need, need to be impaired. Um, and big one for any of you with, with leases where you lease property, um, um, impact of rent concessions. And just to say on that, the ISB have just issued an amendment to the leasing standard. Um, we're still awaiting for that to be endorsed in Europe. Um, and uh, and so it will, you certainly can't apply it in annual accounts until it's been endorsed. Um, we're hoping it will be done during August, but, but it depends on the European political process. Um, and as for whether it can be applied in interim, there, there really is some diversity in the market about, about the acceptability of that. And that is a developing uh, um, issue right now, which we're in discussion with the regulators on as well. Finally, just to, we'll go through all this in detail, but just, just to 
highlight that there have been a number of regulatory reliefs provided by the government uh, and by the market, by the FCA. Um, notice there are now extensions available for annual and interim reporting on both the year market and full list, but the way that you access them is slightly different. You do need to, for AIM listed companies, uh, apply via your nomad um, and, and, and to request and notify that, that any extensions there. Also note that some relaxations around audit, uh, the audit tender rules and indeed audit partner rotation rules as well. Last slide for me, just, just, just broadening the, the discussion a little bit to corporate governance as well. Um, there is a piece of legislation going through Parliament at the moment. We're expecting it to be passed uh, uh, very soon, hopefully this week or next week, um, 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 the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Bill. Um, and the aim of this is to, is to allow some greater flexibility for businesses at this very difficult time. So things like it will, pro it will provide a moratorium from action for liquidation, um, and it will prohibit providers of services and goods from terminating clauses, um, and simply because a company is in, in, in financial difficulties right now, um, and also provides flexibility for the timing of AGMs, although it does, in doing that, um, 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 also require um, and clear communication if you move on to virtual AGMs, you know, being, being absolutely clear with members to allow them to make sort of full, full and frank uh, 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 comments on, on, on what the board is considered and be able to provide questions and to be, to be given complete information to allow them to make decisions given AGMs are, are going to be held in very different ways right now. Um, if you want any more on that, the government has issued their own fact sheets and guidance, and that's available on the uh, BEARS website. And that's all from me. Back to you, Matt. Thank, thanks, Anthony. And uh, again, we can uh, you can ask questions through uh, the question uh, and answer uh, facility on the side of the, the screen. Uh, we've got a couple of questions which I've come to, um, and, and I'll kick off with um, the dividends question to Scott. So um, there's a question, Scott, in terms of uh, should boards be paying uh, dividends or not, and, and what issues uh, should they be considering when they go there? And obviously that's a a legal aspect, but also a cash flow aspect. But uh, interesting to get your insights uh, from your conversations you're having with uh, with boards at the moment. Mm. So it was certain for December year ends who had proposed dividends out of December or based on December balance sheets. It was quite topical. Have those uh, profits or has that balance sheet eroded over the period, and are the reserves there? So a number of companies shelved the payment of dividends. Um, clearly, if you pay a dividend and you didn't have the profit, it becomes an illegal dividend, which is really dangerous territory. So I think you know, you've know you got to draw up a balance sheet. If you're paying dividends uh, based upon uh, profits that haven't been realized um, in the post-balance sheet period, you've got to draw up a special set of accounts um, file them with company's house upon which you base your judgment for paying that dividend. And it's such an uncertain time. There's so many um, uh, potential outcomes. As Anthony said, a lot of accounting standards are forward looking now. So, you know, be cautious in um, how you assess the um, carrying values and how things are realized as profits before paying out dividends. It's a really dangerous area. And I think in a lot of cases, investors are not expecting uh, dividends or certainly not at the level pre-COVID. They would prefer companies to shore up their balance sheet before paying dividends. Okay, thanks very much. And um, Anthony, uh, the, the point on APMs, uh, there's, a, there's a natural uh, tension there, isn't there? Because actually, you want to get as much, uh, I guess, gloss in the accounts as you can do in terms of positive messaging uh, and uh, bury some of the messages to uh, be blamed partially in terms of COVID. Um, it sounded like from your presentation that actually the push is going to be very much in the opposite direction, and in fact, uh, it will be frowned upon should you go that route. Um, what, what do you think you'll be seeing in terms of challenges uh, from, uh, I guess, the accounts review perspective? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's, that's, that's absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the FRC have been 
being very clear on this, and 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 I, and I guess the, there's a few ways of looking at it. First, case, in, in the first situation, what about in terms of the primary statements? There will be a temptation to try and draw out and separate COVID impacts from from uh, um, and the rest of the performance. Um, now, 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 that kind of thing is not absolutely ruled out, but it could only be remotely possible if one that effect was was clearly identifiable, could be reliably measured. You, you know, it was a completely distinct event. But also, what the FRC will be looking for, say, well, you've pulled out, out the um, um, exceptional debits from your PNL. What about any exceptional credits? What about what about government grants? What about what about uh, um, other sources of, of, of income you you you, you saw as part of an adaptation to your business model? So it's fraught with danger. If you don't provide a, a, a valid balance view, now what I would say is it, it, it's more acceptable to be, be provide information in the narrative and and and, and identify some APMs in, in in that. But again, you know, you know, try. We must avoid sort of creating kind of hypothetical pro forma type measures. Um, uh, uh, one challenge that, that 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 came to us was of a company trying to to say what their revenue would have been if it hadn't been for COVID, and that kind of completely hypothetical pro forma information about about in a different world would have things would have happened differently. I think I think the regulators would would would, would be very very skeptical of that, and indeed I think investors will be will be too. Um, and investors just want. An open discussion about what has happened, an explanation of what happened, without you trying to package that uh, in, in one way or the other. So, so I think in the end, um, 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 only do things that can be reliably and distinctly separated and apply balance. And Anthony, there's a lot of talk about a phrase EBITDA uh, with yeah. the C added on for coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, and often EBITDA is used more as a, as a measure for normalized earnings, um, giving an indicator to readers of the accounts of the kind of underlying trends. Mm -hmm. um, there is a bona fide case of wanting to um, indicate to readers how the company's performance has been impacted by coronavirus and what that might look like going forward. Yeah. So there is a, a genuine user case here. There is, there is. But I mean, I think EBIT DAC is one that 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 you know, on an off the record discussion, the FRC have, have been particularly alarmed by. Um, um, and and I think it's that point that, that that how does one properly isolate all of the impacts that coronavirus has has, has had to give in any, any kind of reliable reliable number. Far better to provide sort of detail of the car, of, of of individual impacts rather than trying to claim that that this is a hypothetical or alternative number. Um, um, I think the regulator would, would sort of be concerned with that. Um, I know it happened in uh, I think a German business did it and 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 hit the press with it. It hit the press quite hard on 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 um, and how could this really be possible? Um, so yeah. Provide information, but 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 don't try and create an alternative universe where where, where the coronavirus didn't happen. And and I guess one for both Scott and and Anthony here. Um, so the the FRC have issued uh, an update on the uh, reporting of risk this week. Um, and I guess uh, your observations of what are the key takeaways from from this update, Scott? You first. So I think it's actually a really good publication and definitely worth people looking at. It's on the FRC website. And what it does quite positively is it makes the link between disclosures around going concern, how that then links into risk reporting and what could happen that would impact upon um, that short-term resilience and the longer-term resilience that you see in the uh, viability statement. And you need to take all three together to really understand what we were talking about earlier in terms of resilience. And it gives some real examples of companies that have done this well. Um, so it's it's not the longest publication. Um, it's got some good examples. Definitely worth a read. 
Yeah, I, mean, I think the, 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 the lab reports like that are, are hugely valuable. I mean, they aren't setting requirements, but they really get under the bonnet of some of the issues and, and under the bonnet from the perspective of investors as well. So it does allow preparers to really understand what, what investors think about this. And, 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 I, and, I, and I tried to make the link once or twice in my presentation, but I, I just reiterate what, what uh, Scott's just said. You know, there, there is a thread that runs from going concern through to the materialities relating to going concern through your principal risks, so your risk register and, and your disclosure of principal risks and uncertainties right through to the viability statement. Now, the time periods are different, but the thread is, 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 is a continual one. And uh, um, um, I think that what it re that, that's what that report really does help to illuminate. Um, and, and, and that's where you'll get best practice reporting from, with that, with that holistic look at, at risks like this. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Thanks, Scott. Um, in terms of a uh, quick question for Andy, uh, I guess more in terms of the onerous lease uh, and onerous, onerous contract um, side of things. Um, what, what do you think uh, the non-execs could be doing a little bit more to ensure that, uh, that, that that is complete from a reporting cycle perspective? Yeah, thanks, Matt. So um, I wouldn't expect uh, non-execs to be on top of all uh, contracts that, custom, uh, that, 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 that their businesses would sign. But I do think that they should be challenging um, the CFO and the finance team to understand what process they've been through to identify any onerous contracts. And they should raise that early in advance of, of the half year or the full year, and then look at the response and, and understand whether that in the context of business makes sense. And there may be particular areas of the business where they're worried about onerous contracts and to drill down into that to ensure that the business has done the right job and a thorough job of identifying onerous contracts. Okay, thanks, Andy. And um, I guess one for, again, for I guess the frontline auditors, so Scott and Andy, but um, in terms of uh, overseas interests where um, there are subsidiaries over overseas, um, what approach do you think the non-exec should be taking in terms of getting comfort about what's happening overseas, but also understanding, um, I guess, what the auditor's approach is to um, the overseas entity? Uh, I'll, I'll pass that to Scott first, and then Andy can chip in with any other observations. So typically, the lead auditor needs to go to every um, major component, sometimes on a rotational basis, but I, I think you've got to go to every um, really significant component on an annual basis. When you uh, have a lockdown or travel restrictions, it's really difficult to do that. So um, all of the firms have got software where you can see the files being compiled, but nothing beats having boots on the grounds and really eyeballing people. So if I was an audit committee member, I would be asking the audit firms, how have you um, uh, changed what you would normally do? And how are you confident that you're getting the same level of comfort um, that you would normally get? And um, how are you dealing with the, um, the inability to really eyeball the key people and uh, all of the kind of visual clues that are there, um, and equally in a lot of businesses, just the physical walk around the sites. You know, I do a lot of mining clients, walking around, um, looking at you know assets that are being constructed, is a is a key part of the audit. There's a couple of points I'd add. Um, one is uh, it's quite likely that the mix of overseas revenues might change uh, this year and compared to last year. And so that means that certain subsidiaries that may not have been visited before might need to typically be visited or be um, part of the audit scope. So it's important to understand um, how the mix has changed. Secondly, I think audit committee members should be also looking at the um, internal control environment, both asking auditors a question and their own finance team. So uh, in, in some jurisdictions, clearly uh, finance teams will be working remotely. Some of that internal controls um, that would exist in a physical environment may well be much weaker um, in a non-physical environment where there's not the oversight that might take place with the finance department working closely together. So definitely focus on, on any changes in the internal control environment as well. Thanks, Andy. Um, and again, just from, a, I guess, a, a practical aspect, um, should uh, audit committee chairs 
be looking to have more or less involvement with auditors at this current time, or is it pretty much business as usual? And I'll go to Andy first as the uh, frontline auditor, and then maybe to Scott to see what his experience is. Yeah, um, it's definitely not business as usual, Matt. So I'm seeing an increased amount of um, uh, correspondence and communication and calls at audit committee chairs, um, not just audit committee chairs, but also chairman of clients as well, where um, there's a huge amount of change going on in the business and, and they wanted to understand the impacts on, on, on the financial reporting, um, also views on operating, the, the, how well the finance department's operating in this environment. So I'm seeing a huge amount of more um, increased uh, engagement with audit committee chairs, which obviously um, I think is generally a good thing. Okay, so thank you very much, Andy. I think it's one of the most difficult times to be an audit committee chair. Um, there's so much uncertainty, resilience, you know, the accounting standards are forward looking at complexity. So, you know, it, and it can be a lonely job. So I, um, I think we're seeing a lot of audit committee chairs um, turning up the uh, frequency of communication so that there are no surprises. And, you know, I, I've seen a number of audit committee chairs um, wanting to have calls just to really understand deeply um, some of the issues that are e emerging that are not bog standard and um, wanting to do that way in advance because nobody likes late surprises where you know um, a, a new issue emerges so I think the frequency is definitely greater than we would normally see. Brilliant thanks very much Scott. Um, so, so, Andy, just uh, I guess just moving over to a final question with um, the fact that you, you are recently from the FRC uh, and um, I guess wanting to, to, to pull out some of the insight that you've got from there. Um, what, what do you think the primary focus of the FRC is going to be over this next reporting period, whether that's the, the half year reviews or, or indeed your, the full year accounts that are coming out? What do you think is the primary focus going forward? Uh, I, think, <clears throat> I think it's going to be about but, uh, that those points of transparency, clarity, and then, and then add to that balance. I think what the what they they understand the difficulties in applying accounting standards at this point in time, and the uncertainty that and, and, and the impact of uncertainty on measurement. But they will not see that as any excuse not to comply with the standard. What they will want people to do is provide as much explanation of their accounting judgments, their accounting assumptions. And, and and how that has been impacting on, on the amounts that they, they, they've, they've been recognising. So, so they will be looking for sensitivity analysis. They will be looking for for for, for clarity on on the impact of risk on the, on on measurement. Um, and as I said, that also for that to be done in a balanced way. You know, the 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 the, the temptation, as you put earlier on, of, of sort of providing a polish or, or, a, or a spin to to, to get a a positive gloss on on performance, um, and the regulator will be looking for that. But also, investors just won't trust it. And and and, it, and as I said earlier, investors are looking for a story they understand and they trust, and they know there's uncertainty, and so they expect information that that just is clear on that, explains it, and provides some insight on how that impacts measurement and performance. I think that's that be where the focus of both. Thanks, Anthony. Um, so I'm just going to hand back to Scott just very briefly. So, as I said earlier, I think this is probably one of the most difficult times in um, the last 20 years, at least, um, to be an audit committee chair or an audit committee member. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty, and we've talked about resilience and the linking of the short-term testing of that around going concern. Um, with risk reporting and longer term viability and seeing the three of them as a package. Anthony talked about the accounting standards and standing in the shoes at the balance sheet date. Now, we're only a few months further on from March, but trying to stand in the shoes of how people were thinking or uh, what the, the rational expectations were at the end of March feels like a long time ago. So I think that creates a challenge, and you can't help but be impacted by hindsight there. Um, and I think 
the financial reporting measures are going to be a challenge of navigating, not wanting to create those hypothetical environments where uh, COVID-19 didn't exist and what the results would have looked like. But at the same time, trying to give a steer to users of the accounts what the underlying profitability and performance of the business looks like. Um, and I think that's going to be a challenge to navigate not um, creating those hypothetical environments, but at the same time, trying to help users. And so I think it's a really tough time for people on audit committees. I know nobody's got sympathy, but I think it's a tough time for auditors as well, but there we go. Um, okay, so if we move on to the, the final slide, so thanks for uh, answering the questions today, guys, it's uh, much appreciated. Um, so, so going forward, um, thank you for everyone who's dialed in. Um, we are going to go forward with a, a series, uh, particularly looking at uh, our model Rethink, which um, really focuses on the business and how we uh, looking at BDO internally ourselves and looking at our business, but then taking it out to, to external clients as well. Uh, and um, Anthony did touch on it in terms of the different phases that we've looked at, so the React, Resilience and Realize. Um, and this is really looking through the, the different stages of the, uh, the current crisis. So React is basically safeguarding your business during the, the initial crisis. Uh, resilience, looking at how you keep your business going, but uh, the Realize is actually seeing the opportunity that this, uh, this throws out in terms of the current crisis and, and driving that aspect forward so that uh, we, we maintain and grow value. Um, and so we're going to run a series of these uh, presentations uh, over the uh, WebEx again in the, the near future, so please do look out for these. And we'll be covering um, various aspects in terms of protecting your workforce from a people perspective, um, looking at the, uh, the st strategic and operational side, uh, mitigating the risk that you'll be facing. Uh, we'll come back to the financials and, and, and looking at a wider economic impact, and then looking at the regulatory environment that we're, we're dealing with at the moment from a, a legislation and also a compliance perspective. So we'll be issuing those in um, those invites in a, a series to, to be coming out in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, with that, I will close the call. So thank you for everybody who's joined, uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, catching up uh, uh, in person uh, hopefully in the not too distant future. So thank you very much. And with that, I'll close the call.